Awesome. Thank you, Toby. Good morning. That was a hearty good morning. You guys are more awake than 9.15 was. Uh, my name is Grant. I'm on the team here at Vine, and it is my pleasure to open up God's Word with you this morning to hear what He might have to say to us. So I'm excited. I hope you are too. Uh, let's start off by praying. Join with me. Lord, this morning, might you make your word our rule, your spirit our teacher, and your glory our supreme concern, for the sake of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, sometimes in life, we come up against certain moments or seasons where it just feels like life has run dry. And I'm aware that as I say that this morning, you might be in that very situation. Perhaps this morning it feels as if life has run dry for you because you are experiencing a deep relational pain or struggle. Perhaps for you it's concerns over your physical health. Maybe it's a wrestle with depression or anxiety. Uh, Maybe for you it's uh, concern over financial stability. Maybe for you you're a pastor that's trying, he's not here, but trying to get back into a building And the date just keeps getting pushed back and back and back. There's often times in life, moments and seasons, where it just feels as if life has run dry. And maybe you're not going through that at the moment. And if so, that's great. But it's quite likely that you went through a particular season like that over the last two years during COVID and lockdown. And if not, it's just about guaranteed that you will come into a season like that at some stage in the future. Sometimes in life, we hit a moment where it feels like life has just run dry. And in this morning's passage, we meet a woman where that is the case. Pick up with me from 1 Kings 17, verse 10. If you've got a Bible, it'd be awesome to have it in front of you. Otherwise, you can pull out your phone and get it up there. 1 Kings 17, verse 10. When he, that is, Elijah, came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, And bring me, please, a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. This is a woman whose life has run dry. Verse 1, as Toby tells us, there was drought in the land. And if you know anyone that's just remotely involved in the agricultural industry in Australia, you would know just how devastating those impacts would have been on her. The drought would have caused famine. And not only was this a woman who was uh, in hunger, she was a widow. She'd lost her husband. I don't know if she was a woman in hunger without a husband. It's quite likely that she was also uh, she also had a son who was at the age where he was still dependent upon her. Many believe otherwise it would have been the son that was out searching for sticks. But here this woman is doing just that. And so we find this woman living in an agrarian society with a child dependent on her and no husband. And she's out foraging for sticks so that she might get them together to make her final meal to eat it and die. She was at rock bottom. But then to make matters worse, this guy named Elijah turns up on the scene and she's just about to eat her final meal and he says, "Uh, do you mind if I have it instead? Can I eat it? Like, do you ever hit that moment in life where you feel like you're in rock bottom and then it just gets a little bit worse? That is where we meet this woman in this morning's passage. And we're going to see this morning that God meets this woman who is in starvation and desperation and he provides for her in her greatest need. Let me say that again. This morning we're going to 
see how God meets this woman in her starvation and desperation and provides for her greatest need. And we're going to see how God provides for this woman through three miracles in this morning's passage. And I hope that as we track through, we'll see how God provides for us in our greatest need too. Pick up with me from verse 13. This is how Elijah replies to this woman after just asking for her final meal. He says, verse 13, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me. And then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. The passage goes on. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and food for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. You see, it is here that we see the first miracle in this morning's passage. God seeks out this woman in her starvation and provides for her food. And the way that he does that is by causing this little jug of olive oil that she has to never run dry and this jar of flour to never run out. Can you imagine how that would have felt for her? gets together her last resources, makes for Elijah a meal, provides it for him, and then goes back to make a meal for herself. And the olive oil is still there, and the flour is still there. And she does this again, and again, and again, and again, and again, day after day, for we believe up to perhaps three and a half years years she was able to provide for herself god was able to provide for her through not allowing her flour to run dry or her oil to run out here we meet a woman in starvation and desperation and god provides for her but as we read on in this passage it becomes evident that in this first miracle in this provision of food god wasn't providing for her greatest need. The, the passage goes on. Pick up with me from verse 17. It says, Sometime later, the son of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, What do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? You see, once more, we, we meet this woman in a moment of hurt, a moment of pain, a moment of desperation. She's living in drought. She's got no husband. And now she watches as her one and only son passes away before her eyes. This woman again hits rock bottom. But it's here that we see the second miracle of today's passage. Elijah takes this woman's child and he pleads to God that he might breathe life back into him. And God miraculously hears his prayer, breathes life back into this woman's son, and she is reunited again at last with her son. You see, God in his kindness meets this woman again in a moment of need and provides for her. But again, as hard as it is to believe, this still isn't meeting this woman's greatest. He's provided her food and he's raised her son back to life. But there's something in intriguing going on in this passage. And at first glance, it's easy to miss, but I want to show it to you. Look with me halfway through verse 18. She says, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? Her son dies and she asks, did you come to remind me of my sin and kill my son? And in the rest of our time this morning, I, I want to spend our time unpacking that question that that woman asks. And then I want to show you how it leads to the third and final miracle in this morning's passage. You see, when her son dies, she's caused to ask, is this because of my sin? 
And in some ways, we have no idea whether this is happening to her specifically as a result of a specific thing that she did. But there's nothing in the passage that seems to indicate that that's the case. But she is onto something. You see, if we flick back from 1 Kings all the way to Genesis, uh, the first book of the Bible, I know it's been 10 years since Vine did Genesis, but remember with me back to those times if you were there. Um, you might even be familiar with it. <clears throat> Genesis 1, 2, and 3, God creates the world. And He puts in it Adam and Eve, and He provides for them a garden. And He says to them, go nuts, enjoy yourself. The only thing you can't do is eat from this one particular tree. And what do Adam and Eve do? They turn their backs on God. They reject Him. They rebel against Him. And they do the exact thing that He told them not to do. And in Genesis chapter 3, we see that at that moment, that sin enters the world, death enters the world. And so in some ways, this woman is onto something. Did my son die because of my sin? Well, yes, her son did die because of sin. Without sin, there would not have been death. This death was a result of sin. But we see this in a second, more specific way in today's passage. You see, the drought in the land was a, was a specific result of sin. Toby mentioned at the start that um, the reason why there was this drought in the land is because God had warned His people again and again and again, if you continue to follow these kings that are leading you away from me, if you continue to turn your back on me, there will be a time where drought will enter the land and you will face the consequences of doing that. Um, all the way back in 1 Kings chapter 8, Solomon predicts this. Can we get this verse up on the screen? He says, uh, this is after dedicating the temple. Solomon says, when the heavens are shut up and there is no rain. Why? Because your people have sinned against you. You see, this drought in the land was a specific result of this woman and her son and the nation of Israel and the surrounding countries. Rejection of God. You see, the first link we see between the death of this woman's son and sin is in Genesis 3. When sin enters the world, death enters the world. The second link we see between the death of this woman's son is sin is that the drought came as a specific result of Israel and the surrounding nations turning their back upon God. But thirdly and lastly, we see a link in today's passage, not just between sin and death, between the drought in this woman's life and the death of her son. There's something going on when we dig a little deeper. You see, God could have chosen to send any uh, consequence upon the land, but He chose drought. Why did He do that? Why drought? We'll flick back with me one chapter to 1 Kings 16. 1 Kings 16, I'm going to come up on the screen as well. It says this, Ahab, son of Omni, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Do you guys remember Ahab from last week? Ahab, according to this verse, did more evil than the eyes of the Lord than any of those that were before him. Up until this point, he's probably the worst person in the world. Like he was the worst king that Israel had. And we've watched as king after king after king after king have led Israel away from God. And this guy is the worst of them. And what is it that he's been doing that's so bad? Well, a number of things. But amongst them is that he set up an altar for Baal, in the temple of Baal, he built in Samaria. Now, who's Baal? What's going on here? Well, Baal was a god that the Sidonians worshipped, and he was the god of rain. We've got a, uh, a carving um, of Baal here. I didn't do this. I think this is archaeological evidence that someone found. But here is Baal. And Baal has a spear, a lightning bolt spear, that when it hits the ground, it turns into a tree. You see, Baal was the, the god of this area, um, and he was the god of rain. When it rained, they believed that God sent that, 
And when rain came to the land, uh, crops would come and life would come. Baal was believed to be the god of fertility, the god of life, the god of rain. And here's the thing, when rain didn't come in the land, the people believed it was because of um, Baal's arch nemesis god, whose name was Mot. He was the god of death. And what would happen when there wasn't rain on the land, they believed, was that uh, this god of death, Baal's arch nemesis god, would fight with him and would win in this fight, would beat him and take him down to hell. And so when there was no rain in the land, they were like, oh, I guess uh, Mot, the god of death, won this time. Do you see what's going on here? This widow in Zidon, who worships Baal, the god of life, and worships Mot, the god of death, has a man named Elijah turn up, whose name means Yahweh is God. And Elijah turns up when there's drought in the land, and his God miraculously provides food and life for this woman. Something that Baal was supposed to do. And then when her son dies... Elijah's God, Yahweh, miraculously raises her son back to life. He defeats death, conquers it. The thing that her God, Mot, was supposed to be responsible for. And this is where we see the third and final miracle. You see, this is where we see God providing the thing that this woman needed most. Check out verse 24. This is how the woman responds after seeing God's power over life and death. She says, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is the truth. This woman sees and acknowledges that Elijah's God is the one true living God. Yes, it's an absolute miracle that God would turn up to this woman when she's in starvation and provide food for her. Yes, it is an absolute miracle that when this woman's son dies, he would raise her back to life. But the far greater miracle, the far greater thing that this woman needed in her life was to know that God, that Yahweh is the one true living God and that she might know him and trust in His Word as true. That was her greatest need. And Vine Church, just like this woman's one and only son died as a result of sin in the land, and God raised him back to life so that her greatest need might be met, about 1,000 years later, God sent His one and only Son to die for all sin. And God raised His one and only Son back to life, conquering death, so that anyone who puts their trust in Him might have their greatest need met too. That they might have their sins forgiven and that they might come to know that God is the one true living God. I want to finish just by drawing some quick observations from what we can learn from this woman and her story this morning. Four quick lessons. Number one, this woman's greatest need wasn't food. As hard as that is to believe. Her greatest need wasn't the raising of her son back to life. Her greatest need was to know the one true living God. And so when it feels like life has run dry, when we're in our greatest moment of pain, hurt, frustration, or anger... If our trust is in God, we can take comfort. Our greatest need is met. Number two, we might find ourselves wondering in life, when life feels as if it has run dry, where God is. 
we might find ourselves asking, God, what are you doing? Why would you allow this to happen to me? You can imagine that's how the woman would have felt in starvation and looking over her dead son's body. But as we read this story, as we have kind of the advantage of hindsight, we see that God used these tragic events in her life to bring about her ultimate good. And we can trust when it feels as if life has run dry, when we have no idea what's going on, that our God is good and that He uses all things for the good of those who love Him, even when we might have no idea how. Thirdly, just like when Adam and Eve sinned, death entered the world. When Jesus died, death was defeated. Sin was defeated. This passage points us to another son who was swallowed up in death, but entered from the inside and defeated it. Defeated death, defeated sin. And in doing so, made a way for us to get back to God. And in doing so, we can have hope that one day when Jesus calls us home or when Jesus returns, we will have an eternity where life never runs dry, where there will be no pain, no sickness, no mourning. Eternity where life never runs dry. And fourthly and finally, we can trust that the same God that through the death and resurrection of His Son rescued us from sin will sustain us through it. There's plenty more to be said here and I could preach an entire talk on this alone. But Jesus is our bread that never runs out. He's the the jar of flour. He's the jug of oil. Jesus turns up and he refers to himself as the bread of life. Jesus is the one that when life runs dry, we can run to him. We can trust in him. And he promises us. He will give us the food that we need. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story where you sought out a woman, a widow in need, in hunger and desperation. And you met her where she was at. And Lord, you showed yourself to her to be the one true living God. You gave her the thing that she needed most. And Lord, this morning, I pray for everyone this morning that perhaps is just at a moment in a season where life feels as if it has run dry. Lord, help them see that the thing they need most is you. Help us, Lord, please, in faith to cling to you, to hold to you, to rely upon and depend on you. And Lord, in this season, in those seasons, might you bring about in us what is best for us. And Lord, we thank you most of all that you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us, who defeated death, so that one day we will never have a life that runs dry. But for we'll, we'll forever be with him. No sickness, no death, no mourning, no pain. Help us run looking forward to that day. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.